Good morning again, everybody. Good morning. It is um, good to be able to share with you today, and uh, we're glad that you're here. And let me uh, say a word of welcome to everyone, and uh, for the worship time we've had this morning, and uh, for the music, and for time around the table. It's been a good day. In just a few moments, I'm going to invite your attention to the book of Acts, chapter 2, and we're going to start in uh, verse 37. I want us to think about for a little while this morning, what makes you really excited and really enthused and uh, really really gets you going? Uh, if you live anywhere uh, uh, near Lakeland on County Line Road, this past Thursday, a brand new Publix uh, opened their wow. doors for the very first time. Wow. Uh, now, we had, uh, we had some needs for groceries, and we went there. <laughs> And I don't think I've said good morning to as many people in my life as a long time. The, they had all of their employees there. And of course, Lakeland being the corporate headquarters, they had tons of executive types there. You could not turn a corner without someone saying to you, can I help you? Did you, did you find everything? What do you need? How can I be of service? And uh, I'll tell you what, made you glad to be there, made you think, wow, they really like us here. Maybe we need to make this our regular grocery store. There's something just kind of uh, uh, very exciting about new things. Why, Mary and I just took a trip a few weeks ago to Wisconsin to see a new grandson. If you don't believe me, I'll show you many pictures uh, on my phone afterwards of little Lennox uh, Lofton and and uh, just how exciting it was to be with a new baby and new moms and dads. We like that. We get it. This morning we're going to talk about a time when the church was brand new. And it was exciting. And there was a sense of awe and wonder. It was a time when God was doing amazing things and people just wanted to be a part of that. And so we're going to use a term today, we'll see it in our text, they were continually devoted. Wouldn't that be nice if that were able to be said about us, that we are continually devoted to the church. We're not hot one day and cold another day. We're not here today and gone tomorrow. Why, today it's bright and shiny and it's exciting and tomorrow, blah, 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 same old thing. And if I go, fine. If I don't, fine. Uh, the early church had that sense of commitment. Uh, there's a verse from the Old Testament I just wanted to throw out there. It's one you probably heard me use before from Psalm chapter 122 and verse 1. It simply says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Sometimes we're glad when someone says, hey, you want to go fishing? Hey, you want to go try out a new restaurant? Yeah, I'd be glad to do that. Imagine having that sense of excitement about going to the Lord's house on the Lord's day and meeting with the Lord's people around the Lord's table. To have that sense of enthusiasm and to have that sense of excitement. We're going to begin this morning from the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Some verses I know many of you are very familiar with. They're used all the time, especially in the Christian church. Peter had just wrapped up the first gospel sermon. Imagine being able to say that. Peter just preached the first sermon uh, in the New Testament age, and when he finished... He said something like this. He says, now let the house of Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Can you imagine that? Peter just said, you people are responsible for crucifying Jesus. You people are guilty of the blood of the Son of God. And so verse 37, normally we find this verse at a conclusion of a sermon, but today I'm using it right at the start. When they said, uh, uh, when Peter said, you're responsible, here's what they said. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the brethren, or to the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent. 
And each of you should be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here it is right at the beginning of this sermon where Peter says, you want to know what to do because you're guilty of crucifying the Son of God? You want to know how to have your sins forgiven? Here it is. Repent. The change of mind that leads to a change in action. He says, each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus and two great things are going to happen. Number one, you're going to get your sins forgiven. You're going to be innocent again in the sight of God. You're not going to be held accountable for the sins you've previously committed. And then secondly, he says, you're going to get the gift of the Holy Spirit. Imagine that. Being baptized brought them into a new, saved relationship with God. It paved the way for them to be able to do exciting things. They had the forgiveness of sins, and then they were going to get the indwelling presence of God in the form of the Holy Spirit. Let's go on a little bit. It gets better. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are as far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Peter says this offer is for you, but it's for your kids. And your grandkids, matter of fact, is for the whole world. As many as God will call to himself, they can have the same opportunity. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. We're going to come to that one in just a minute. Verse 41. So then, those who had received his word were baptized... Imagine this. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. That one, you, you, you ever get a 1,000 day? Never. A 2,000, a 100 yep. day? Lucky but imagine that. Uh, we're excited for one. If God Amen. bless every one of them. But the idea is on that day with the preaching of the gospel, 3,000 people said, I'm in. 3,000 people responded to the invitation. They were baptized, and that day the church began. They were, here's our word, continually devoting themselves four things. We'll talk about this a little bit. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Some of your translations may say the apostles' doctrine. And to fellowship, well, that's what's going on here, to the breaking of bread, which we just had a few moments ago, ago and to prayer, which we've had throughout this morning. We carry on a grand tradition. Do you know that? We're part of something that happened more than 2,000 years ago because the promise is to us and to our children and to as many as the Lord shall call to himself. They were baptized. 3,000 people that day experienced the goodness and the promise of the Lord, and they had their sins forgiven. And they received the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. I want to just share some, I think, important lessons that we gain from our text today. Things that some of us need to be reminded about. And maybe some of us are just hearing for perhaps the first or the second or the third time. And the first one I would say would go like this. That God is calling God still calls people to repentance. God still calls people to have their sins forgiven. God still tells us the way it needs to be done. And when God calls, we need to answer appropriately. There's a right way to answer God, and there's a wrong way to answer God. Well, I bet none of you just pick up a phone and say, yeah, what do you want? I don't do that. I imagine many of you don't do that. Sometimes with the telemarketers, I know it gets hard, right? Uh, we've all been offered that car extended warranty so many times. It's hard to be appropriate and nice on the phone. Uh, one person who won't identify himself in the room on more than one occasion when it was a telemarketer picked up the phone and said, thanks for calling Domino's. Will you hold? Click. And uh, that was the end of the conversation. You know, and hopefully they took someone's name off the list who will go anonymous this morning. There's a right way to answer the phone politely and not being rude. 
And even with telemarketers, we can simply say, I am not interested, have a nice day, and conclude a conversation. I think about some of the great calls that God gave in the Old Testament to a young boy uh, by the name of Samuel. There he was, just kind of helping out the priest, his kind of gopher, and one day he heard a voice saying, Samuel, Samuel. He thought it was the priest, is what he wanted. I didn't call him. Well, someone did. And you know, go back to the guy went back to sleep. And there is Samuel again. And he didn't know at the time it was God, but God was calling him Samuel, Samuel. And so Samuel went back to the priest. No, it's not me. It might be God. And so if he calls you again, say these words. Speak, Lord, for thy servant hears you. And sure enough, God said, Samuel, and Samuel, Lord, speak. Your servant is listening. There's a right way to respond to God. Many of us, yeah, 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 I've heard it before. Yeah, no, I'm not happy where I'm at. I'll get to God one day. Later on in the Old Testament, we read about Isaiah. And God asked him the question, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And there's your call. Who's, who's going to go? And Isaiah answered correctly and appropriately, here am I. Send me. When God calls, we need to answer, and we need to answer appropriately. We need to say yes to God. We need to say yes to service. We need to say yes to leadership, yes to giving, yes to sharing in the work of the Lord's church here. God is still calling us. Now, I know people get kind of far afield with that concept. I think God calls us through the gospel. I think God calls us through the word. And as it's shared, whether it's being taught or it's being preached, God still calls us to come to him. Why is he calling? Because salvation still hangs in the balance. Souls are still lost. People are still dying in sin outside of Christ. And so God calls us back to repentance. You might remember Romans chapter 10. Faith comes from hearing. And hearing by the word. And how will they hear without a preacher? And so when we share the word of God, it is in effect God calling people to repentance and to service and to salvation. It's about things like salvation. Because these things still hang in the balance. Let's go on a minute and ask ourselves the question now. Do we actually hear God's call? Are you really listening? There are so many things that call for our attention. There are so many things that pull us away from God. So many voices that say the Bible is old and outdated. It's not true. You can't trust it. So many people saying that the way of secular humanism is the way to go. So many people saying things like you want to have your fun. You want to fulfill all your appetites. You want to make yourself happy. And the Bible's totally against that. God is still calling us to say no to the world and say yes to him. Amen. Peter made this great comment here and it's found in Acts chapter 2 and verse 40, not 1 and verse 40, my fault on that one. Peter said this, be saved from this perverse generation. Now he said that in the first century, 2,000 years ago. Now we think we got it bad. We think we have it tough with things like same-sex marriage, and the list goes on. We think, oh, Peter didn't know it, but no, things were bad then, too. Morality was bad then, just as it is today. I was thinking about this, and I'm reminded that just yesterday, the governor of the great state of North Carolina, where I lived about 19 years, he just vetoed the bill. And this bill, bill would have made it illegal to abort a baby on the basis of its gender or whether or not it had Down syndrome. And so now, if you didn't want a little baby boy, well, you just go ahead and abort it, and maybe next time you'll get a girl. Or if this baby has this particular illness or problem, go ahead and abort it, and maybe next time your next child will be healthy. You talk about a perverse generation where even elected leaders are making these kind of decisions this is a perverse generation. Church, we're called to be salt and light. Amen. We're called to, to really preach about these things that are just wicked in the world. And I know 
there's a lot of other moral issues we could talk about today, but you don't have to look very far to find evidence to the fact that we live in a perverse uh, generation. And so when we hear the call of God, we say, you know, there's just something not right about the world. There are things going on that just don't seem to no, know. That's not right. God is calling us to listen to him. And when we need a word on morality, when we need a word on right and wrong, you're not going to get it from the 6 o'clock news. You're not going to get it from your elected government officials most of the time. But if we want to know what is right, it's still found in the pages of God's word. We need to be saved from this world. And the only way we're going to be saved is not by listening to the voices of the world. It's by listening to the unerring word of God. Are we really listening to the call of God? Because he is still calling us. Secondly, this morning, I want to talk about God adding to the church. Does it make you feel good to know you're part of the family of God. Yes. Bill Gager, decades ago, wrote a uh, song that's still sung to this day where he said, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. You remember that one? That's an oldie and moldy one, but it's still a good one. Yeah. He said, joint heirs with Jesus as we travel to Sod Fort. I'm glad to be a part of the family of God. And a great concept there. We know how important our family is. We miss the loved ones who are no longer here. We're excited about the new ones that come into the family. We're excited about weddings and these kinds of things as the family grows. We're part of the family of God. We're part of his kingdom. And as part of the church, we are now family members with one another. I know some of us have issues in the family. We could tell some more stories on that. I'm sure we all could. But in the church, we have brothers and sisters. I'm reminded that even in the book of Hebrews, we're told that for this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers. Now, that's pretty cool, isn't it? The Son of God looks at us like family. He's one of ours. In John 1, it says we can be children of God. Paul to the Galatians says we cry out to God, Abba, Father. You talk about a strong family relationship. The one who designed the family is none other, none other than God himself. And he invites us to be a part of his family. In the New Testament, we find words like we are the bride of Christ. We were just here for a wedding not too very long ago. There is a beautiful bride. And to think that we are part of that family of God together. We talk about being adopted into the family of God. All of these things are very important. And verse 41 reminds us again that this privilege of being part of the family of God are for those who have been made part of his kingdom. One of the benefits of repenting of our sins and being baptized into Christ is that this time we get our adoption papers. At this time we are made part of this great and fa a family of God. So what then is the proper response to all that God has done for us? Now, there's two options here. Number one, we could just be casual. I don't know if that's going to show on that one up very well or not. Some of us have a very casual outlook in our relationship with God. And it's kind of, God, I will give you just so much. I'll give you 50% of my life, but the other 50% is mine. Some of us are casual to say, well, if the weather is good, I'm going to go do X, Y, or Z. But the weather's kind of iffy. Okay, we'll go to church. My favorite show is on. I cannot go to Bible study. I cannot read the scripture. But maybe if the show is a rerun, well, then I can take a look at my Bible. Do you see where I'm going here? When it's convenient for me, why then I'm uh, glad to be a part of the family of God. But when I got something else to do, well, then God's going to have to wait a week. Jesus had some things to say about that kind of casual attitude with God. He said that he that puts his hand to the plowshare and then looks back is not fit to be a disciple. You know what that means? If you sign up to be with Jesus, it needs to be day in, day out, 24-7. It can't just be, well, it's Sunday, I'll go to church, but Monday through Saturday, those days are mine. 
those days I do what I want to do. Some of us are very casual. Maybe we're kind of haphazard. The old word lackadaisical. Whatever word works there. Some of us have that kind of mentality about a relationship with God. We need to be intentional. You know, mom and dad, I bet we were intentional, intentional about getting our kids to school during the school year. I bet we're intentional about getting them to doctors and dentist appointments. As mature, responsible adults, we're probably intentional. Yeah, I got to get up and go to work, I drive, but I got to do it. I got to pay the bills. And we make these things priorities, and that's what we're going to do. We need to be more intentional about a relationship with God. So we need to ask him, what is he calling us to do? And are we doing it? Are we as involved as we should be? Be intentional in this relationship. And then the, the, the really neat thing about the church. And how do you describe it? What were they doing and what were they about? We're told here that the early church devoted themselves to four different things. And each one of these is a sermon. Each one of these is a series of sermons. And obviously we don't have the time for that this morning. But let's think about that. And I don't know that these are even in order of priority. They're all important. They're all things we need to do. So I don't think number one is more important than number three or number four less important. Than, I think they're there. But it's a list, and I like lists, and so we're going to look at the list, okay? He said first, uh, the first thing they were devoted to is the apostles' teaching. Well, you'd expect the teacher to kind of like that one, right? You'd expect that someone who taught doctrine for years and years to be excited about that. But you know, when you think about it, Sometimes we think, well, what does God really think about whatever the issue might be? What does God really think about gender? Are there just two? Or are there 50, like some people say? What does God's word say about baptism and all the different views about that? What does God's word say about the end times and when is Jesus coming back and how is it going to look like? Uh, what does the Bible say about communion? What does the Bible say about giving offerings? And the early church were devoting themselves to learning these things. They wanted to know as much about this book as they possibly could. They didn't just say, oh, the preacher knows that stuff, so I don't need to know it. They wanted to know it, and they were devoted to that concept. And so uh, uh, this morning, as Fred gave the list of talking about a well, Wednesday night, a Friday night, and Sunday school or Bible study, these are opportunities for you to learn and emphasize your devotion and the priority you place on the teaching of God's Word. Good things to be involved in. A fellowship. I, mean, I think we have that going on pretty well. The concept of, hey, it's good to see. Oh, look, someone's new. I want to introduce myself to that person and get to know them. I want to spend time with them outside of the four, well, we have more than four walls in this room. I want to spend time with them uh, outside of the sanctuary and in other parts of life as well. Why? I love spending time with my family. I have family here. And it's good to be able to share and be a part of their life. The early church devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. We can't talk enough about the Lord's Supper and how important that is. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, if that verse isn't underlined or highlighted in some way or committed to memory, it really needs to be. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, it says the early church met on the first day of the week yeah. for the breaking of bread. Amen. As is so important. Every week we need that. I need that. I need that reminder that Jesus loved me enough to die on the cross for me. And that he was buried and that God was so powerful he raised him from the dead three days later. I need that constant reminder. Why? Because the world's going to fill my mind with so much other nonsense and junk that maybe my tendency or temptation would be, well, yeah, yeah, I know, I'm blah, and just not really pay that much attention to it. I need a devotion. I need the scripture. I need that time of meditation where, again, I can come to God and say, thank you for doing for me what I couldn't do for myself, for saving me even though I certainly don't deserve it, and I certainly didn't live the way I should have last week, but God helped me in this coming week to do better. Just that time of a simple piece of bread and a little bit of juice 
and the reminder that that bread represented the body of the Son of God that was broken for me. And that juice represents the blood that was shed on the cross for the forgiveness of sins and a new covenant, a new relationship with God. I need that. And then for prayer. Oh, we need prayer. Yeah, we pray for the sick, for sure. We pray for those who are struggling. We thank God in our prayers for all the blessings that we enjoy. We intercede on behalf of others that need the help of God. These are things that we can do not only in our homes and individually, but corporately. Remember that Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am. And we invite the presence of God here. These are things that we must be constantly reminded about to be continually devoted to the teaching of the scripture to the fellowship we have with one another, to the breaking of bread, communion, Lord's Supper, however you choose to identify it, and to pray together. These are great things that we have, privileges in the church. So what's the outcome of all of this? If we do the job that we need to do, in terms of being devoted to the scripture, to fellowship, to breaking of bread and prayer, what's that going to do for me? We're kind of outcomes-based people, aren't we? We want to know if I work so many hours at work, how much money am I going to get? We want to know what's the benefit of taking care of something and so on and so forth. What's the benefit of our devotion? Number one, we're going to have a closer walk with God. God won't seem so very far away. Because we're inviting him into our life and into our heart. We're sharing with him just like I share with my wife. I can share with God the things that make me mad, the things that make me glad, the things I'm struggling with, the hurts, and all of these things. We will have a closer walk with God the more we are devoted to him. Our Christian life will be stronger and more meaningful. Sometimes people say, well, I'm a member at the country club, I'm a member at the moose club, I'm a member at this place, and I'm a member at the church. Like, it's all the same. But when we are continually walking and growing in our relationship with God, the church will be far different and far better than any earthly association you might have. It will be meaningful. It will help us in our daily walk. This third one can't be emphasized enough. Salvation. We are saved people. I know in this world those are areas that uh, preachers tend maybe not to talk about as much anymore. Because people don't really want to hear about sin. They don't really want to hear about changing your life, that you're doing things wrong. We live in a time when people say anything you do that you want to do, that's okay. Go ahead and do it. No one, don't let anyone tell you you can't. Don't listen to the old morals of the past and they don't count anymore. And as we are reminded about the truth of God's word, then we recognize we need to say goodbye to the world. Didn't we die to the world in Christian baptism? Didn't we put to death the things of the old way to be raised and walk in newness of life? We need to talk about matters of salvation. Not people don't want to hear about hell. They don't want to hear about the fire. They don't want to hear about the screams and the anguish. They'd like to hear about heaven for sure. But they don't want to hear about the things they must do in order to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Friends, there's so many benefits to being devoted to God. To putting God first, to, uh, uh, to emphasize in your life devotion to the things we've mentioned here this morning. I pray that you will take this seriously and remember the words from Acts chapter 2 and verse 41 where it says, So then... Those who had received his word were baptized. It made sense. They believed it. They wanted it for themselves. They trusted God. Oh, they knew they were sinners and what they deserved, but they said, hey, here's a better way for us to go. Christians this morning, I know many of you have already made that great, important, essential decision. But we probably still have a decision we can make today about our devotion. Where are we in our commitment to learning and knowing God's word? In fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers, do we need to step up a little bit? Are we kind of drifting away and we know we need to come back closer to God? That's a decision we can make today as immersed believers.
But if there's anyone here today who has not made that essential life-changing decision to repent of your sins and put Jesus first in your life, then today can be that day for you. Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this passage of scripture this morning. We're thankful that it shows to us a way, the only way that we can be saved and be right in your sight. We're thankful for that wonderful sermon that Peter preached and that amazing response that was received that day. Lord, as a church, we pray that you would help us in our devotion, that we would be devoted to your word, the fellowship, the meeting around your table, as you call this, and the prayer. Help us to be a praying church. Bless the decisions that we all need to make today. That would be our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's not going to happen today. But I rejoice with just the decision. It's awesome. And you blessed me, girls, with that decision. Um, I hope I hope to see the consummation of your decision when uh, in August or whenever, whenever you, you want to make that known. But um, we've got a family that comes down all the way from Webster. And I, I can't figure out what's, what's so special down here, but somehow Joey and Olga have figured out that this is where they want to be. Talk about dedication. Amen. I, 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 I really don't know anybody in the church, including myself, that's so dedicated as these two are. And relatively new Christians, I mean, relatively, I, baptized Joey, what, a couple, a year and a half ago, or something like that, but he's, I've seen the change in him. There, there's a change when a person decides to follow Jesus, and there's a change in behavior and attitude, the whole thing, and and if, if I could find a poster child for that, Olga, you know, you're it. You and Joey are it. Amaris, I, Amaris made that decision. She's just a young girl just coming up, but she wants to be involved, and so Thank you for that sermon today. Thank you for the attitude that comes with wanting to serve Christ with all of your heart. And thank you for all of you families. I, I don't want to diminish any other family here in what is done and, and what is uh, accomplished coming arm in arm to defeat Satan, to defeat evil and ugliness in our life, and to embrace all that is good and holy and righteous. But today, I, I know there was decisions made there. Maybe somebody else has got a decision. Listen, the way we do it here, some churches you just stand up and, and the preacher might say, you know, what do you want? <laughs> some churches you come down and you walk down during the invitation song and, and you make it known there's a, little, there's a little card. That's kind of the way we do it here. It, it doesn't matter how you do it. You can talk to any of us after the service that you feel are members here in this church, and we'll, we'll get it through the grapevine to where we can minister to you. Blair's gonna be out here for a little while, so go, go say hi to him. Tell him what a great job he's doing. Encourage him, because he is doing a great job. We're, we're fortunate to have guys with his caliber here, he and his family, him and Mary both. May God bless every one of you here today. I, I hope that the word of God has gotten through the exterior and has pierced down to where you really live. And that true change will occur that will make you open your eyes to all that the Father, Abba Father, has for you today. Wow, it's good to be here. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, well. I don't know what to do at this point. I'm kind of like Blair last week. Do I get up? He did. He did a good enough thing. Uh, what do I do? So um, I'm gonna let you finish up with a song, Brother Donnie. Let's give it up for Brother Donnie. He does. Wow. And so, um, if you've made a decision, I'm gonna stand here. If you've made a decision after his song, come up. And let me know.